Okay, so today um, will be a brief um, video just talking about the difference between correlation and causation. Okay, so in the last few lessons we've discussed associations between variables and correlation between variables and we've started to learn about this idea of the correlation coefficient as a way to describe the strength of the association or the strength of the correlation between the two variables. Now, the thing we need to be really careful about when talking about correlation is that we're not trying to infer any causation from the correlation. Okay, so what we mean by that is just because you have two variables that are strongly correlated, we can't necessarily say that that means that one of the variables is causing the other variable to happen. Okay, so, you know, if, if we can see a strong correlation between height and weight, um, we can describe the fact that there is a strong correlation between those two variables but what we can't say is as a person um, as a person's weight increases their height also increases that that the change in weight causes the change in height okay so it's really important that we're we're clear about that and we need to be a bit careful about our language when we talk about these kind of associations and relationships between variables so as an example, um, in 2016, The Economist published an article highlighting the correlation between student performance on the PISA educational tests and annual ice cream consumption per year across a range of OECD countries. And here's the graph here. So we see here that we've got an R squared, so a coefficient of determination of 0.49. So that means that R would be the square root of 0.49. And we can see that it's a positive correlation so it's going to be positive point um, square root and that is a correlation coefficient of 0.7 so that's a reasonably strong correlation moderate to strong okay um, correlation between these two variables um, but this is where we need to be really careful just because these two variables are correlated strongly just because it seems that um, countries that um, average higher scores on the PISA tests also tend to eat more ice cream. It doesn't mean that we're suggesting those two things cause each other. That because um, <laughs> it's unlikely that, that high scores on PISA tests cause people to eat more ice cream or vice versa. Um, so it's really important that we're careful about that interpretation. We'll talk more about the sorts of things that might be happening and the different situations. Sometimes it's just complete fluke coincidence that there is correlation. Sometimes, however, there might be a third variable involved. So, for example, in this instance, it might be to do with wealth. It might be to do with wealthier countries tend to perform better on um, PISA tests and equally in wealthier countries people um, are better able to afford luxuries like ice cream so it might not really be about ice cream and pizza performance at all there's nothing there's no cause there but there is a correlation so we want to be really clear about the difference between those two statements so that's a pretty extreme example, very different variables. Um, another example, if we think about this graph we've looked at in previous videos, um, where we looked at uh, moderate to strong, also correlation coefficient of 0.7, um, correlation between average number of hours of study per week in year 12 and ATAR scored. Um, and so again, we can't infer that more study per week causes an increase in the ATAR. But we could probably, you know, using a bit of logic and common sense, suggest that it's probably is one of the factors. Now the issue is obviously there are going to be many other factors involved in, in what is causing a student to get a high ATAR score. Study time is one of them, but there are many, many other variables as well. So we can't simply say um, that increasing study causes a higher ATAR definitively. That's not what this data is telling us. We would need to do further study to, to determine any cause. What this data is telling us is that there is numerically a connection between these two variables. The data tells us that there seems to be a tendency that is one variable increases, the other also increases. Okay, We're not trying to say that one causes the other though. So we talked about the fact that sometimes it could be to do with a third variable. So there are sort of um, three um, non-causal explanations for an association, where an association might seem a bit strange um, and we can't infer causation. 
um, but there might be other reasons for why we're seeing an association. The first is this common response um, option, which is what we saw in the ice cream and pizza tests, where I said that in fact it was possibly a country's wealth um, that was um, affecting the two other variables. Okay, so those two, the changes in pizza scores and ice cream were a common response to changes in the wealth of the country. Um, so correlation between, in common response, correlation between two variables could be explained by both being a common response to a third variable. So the previous example, as I said, ice cream consumption and PISA scores being a response to relative wealth of the country. Um, another example, a study might identify a strong correlation between house size and life expectancy. So we can't assume that owning a bigger house will lead to increased life expectancy. We're not suggesting there's cause there. But instead, what could be happening is that a third variable to do with income could be responsible for both people having larger houses and increased life expectancy. Okay. Another example could be the strong correlation found between the number of people using sunscreen and the number of people fainting. So we're not, um, if we were to assume that there's causation here, we would be um, thinking that the use of sunscreen causes people to faint, which is not what's happening at all. There's a correlation. Okay, we can't infer cause, but what we might be able to think about is, well, actually, it's quite possible that the changes in both of these variables are being explained by a third variable, which is the temperature. Warmer temperatures, people tend to use more sunscreen, people might be more likely to faint. Okay. We can also have, um, and slightly similar, a confounding variable. So a confounding variable is also where a third variable is having an impact, but it's more to do with the fact that there might well be cause between the, the two variables that we're identifying the association with, okay? Like the ATAR score and the study hours, okay? There is probably some cause there that more study increases ATAR, but there are other confounding variables also having an impact on ATAR, and we can't look at, we can't say, you know, with any definitiveness from the data that we're looking at, with any um, <laughs> definite, oh, my language has, has left me, we can't say with any certainty that, um, the number of hours studied is what's causing the higher ATA. It's probably part of it with other confounding variables also contributing to that higher ATA score. Um, so it's, it's, it's possible that there is causation involved. We can't say that there is, but there might be. But we might also acknowledge that there could be other variables contributing um, as well. So for example, there might be a strong correlation between lack of exercise and heart failure. Now it's quite reasonable to think that there's probably some causation there. Lack of exercise, more likely to cause heart failure. Um, however, it's likely that there are also many other confounding variables affecting um, the likelihood of someone having heart failure. Genetics, diet, um, again, wealth and access to healthcare, all sorts of other things that are part of that. Um, another example could be strong correlation between employment and crime in a particular city. So it's feasible that high employment results in increased crime. Um, but it could also be that both those things are a result of a depressed economy, okay, or a recession or, or that sort of thing. The third situation, so we've got common response. There's actually no cause between the two variables we're seeing the correlation um, between, but they're both a response to a third variable or um, confounding variables. There might well be cause between the two variables that we're seeing the association between. But again, there could be a third or more variables um, or other variables that are impacting both of those as well. Um, and finally, it could simply be a coincidence. Okay. Um, it should be noted, though, that the larger the data set, the more um, data you've got, the less likely that a correlation is going to be pure coincidence. It's likely there is something driving it, whether it's a confounding variable, whether it is um, a common response to another variable, or whether actually there is cause, but we would need further study. What we're looking at, just looking at correlation coefficient, just plotting scatter plots, we can't in any way suggest cause. So we just need to be really careful about the way we go about describing these sorts of situations. Um, I've just got a couple of other graphs that um, I found with interesting correlations where we wouldn't necessarily assume causation. Um, so this graph here, it's not a scatter plot, but we're seeing, um, and we haven't got a correlation coefficient, but it's clear that we're seeing an association or a fairly strong correlation here between the number of ice cream sales and the number of shark attacks. Obviously, this is a northern hemisphere um, 
example in that both those things are peaking in July um, or a little after July. Um, so again here it's not that buying more ice cream causes more shark attacks or more shark attacks mean that people buy more ice cream. There's likely to be a, a common response here, both of these variables being the common response to temperature. Okay, we're seeing the peak of both these things is in summer. People are more likely to be swimming, hence more likely um, to suffer shark attack and people it's hot and so people are more likely to be eating ice cream. Um, so that would be an example of common response. These two graphs here both show in slightly different ways. The, on the left, we've got a scatter plot. We've got the correlation coefficient up there of 0.955, so a very strong correlation. Um, and we've similarly got those um, two things plotted as time series data, which we'll talk a little bit more about. And we can see that there's a, a fairly common pattern between the, the shapes of the two, um, the two curves. And the variables here that we're looking at is the number of engineering doctorates awarded um, and the per capita consumption of cheese. So again, we're not trying to suggest that um, the more cheese someone eats, the more or the more cheese per capita a country eats, the more likely they are to get doctorates um, in engineering or vice versa. Um, but again, we're probably looking for um, these two things are pretty unrelated. So we're probably looking for a common response to something, and again, it's probably to do with wealth. Okay, wealthy countries more likely to be awarding. Um, doctorates full stop, more likely to be educated, more likely to be able to afford luxuries like cheese, eating lots of cheese. Um, the third example I've got here <coughs> is a fairly common example if you Google um, correlation versus causation and that is looking at the divorce rate in Maine in particular versus per capita consumption of margarine. So again looking at here Obviously both these things are decreasing over time. We've also got a third variable on this graph showing time. Both these things are decreasing over time, but we're seeing they both follow a fairly similar um, tread, um, trend. Sorry. So um, as the diverse divorce rates decrease, which is the red line, we're seeing that the margarine consumption decreases in a pretty similar, in fact, an alarmingly similar kind of pattern. Um, and as I said, this is one of those examples that you'll see when people are trying to illustrate this point that it's highly likely this is this is just complete coincidence. You know, it's it's highly unlikely that there is. Well, I can't think of a third variable or a confounding variable um, which would be impacting both of these things: um, divorce rate and margarine consumption. So again, it's about okay. We note strong correlation here. Hmm, that's interesting. We don't try to make any judgment about the cause or what might be causing. Okay. All right. So um, have a go. Um, it's a fairly um, short exercise there at um, having a look at these issues around correlation causation. Is there a common response, a third variable involved, um, and what might we um, be able to say about those things?